So now, what I was just responding to is to the side of the of the Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to get a start because uh, we have something very exciting to do today. So, uh, I think we'll get right to it. Uh, this is a very special event for us to present here in the Digital Literacy Center. Uh, it is uh, part of an artist in residency uh, that is being uh, hosted by the Chan Center. Uh, of UBC and together with the Department of Language and Literacy Education, uh, we're hoping that you're going to enjoy the show. We're realizing it's getting it's getting busy, so if you can grab a seat or sit against the chair, the tables at the back. Uh, today, what we're uh, presenting to you is something quite unique, quite special. You have probably come across the wonderful world of classical music, and you probably come across the wonderful world of poetry. Uh, in this department alone, we consider uh, these, these two uh, genres to be ways that we can express and explore understandings, do research and what have you in the arts. This really fits that model because it steps outside of any convention and expectations. It's hoped that you had a chance prior to this to go and look online and uh, see some of what this amazing duo do when they get together. Now, uh, Mark Bamuthi Joseph and Daniel Bernard, Bernard Brumain, uh, also known as uh, TBR, uh, are both really seriously accomplished artists in their own right. They've been exploring and challenging conventions in the arts ever since they've been really young. This is, a, this is an astounding place to encounter these two artists in their careers, not just because they're so accomplished in doing uh, their work in the fields of music and in the fields of literature on their own paths. But here we see this amazing collision. It's like one of those atomic colliders that they have. <laughs> and these two are coming together and they're splitting atoms they're rather than splitting hairs. They're, they're doing something <laughs> quite unique because they're bringing together really different fields and wetting it in a way that I personally never seen, and I, I think I've got a pretty good understanding of both these two fields, and I've never seen something quite like this. It stands outside. So on one angle, we see a fellow who's passed poetry, a slam champion, who's done hip-hop in a whole wide range of different contexts, is, is a verbal genius in what he puts together as far as the expression of something. And here he's working with somebody who's a highly acknowledged classical composer who does, and I mean modern classical, I mean experimental music, but for, for orchestras, who's uh, composed for uh, organizations like the Boston Pops, which doesn't probably strike you as the most innovative of orchestras, if you know about the Boston Pops, but here they have welcomed into their work the kind of insight and innovation that's being brought out now. These two get together and they share one aspect especially in common. They have a Haitian background. And in this work that they brought together, they've been exploring not just the kind of conventional understanding of what that means, they've just been investigating every aspect of what their, of what their work can draw out of the experience, post all of the difficulties, the long-standing history of the Haitian people, and also how that connects to the history of slavery in African American society and what that's led to today. So they bring all that history and in this moment of collision they're both pre-composed and improvised collaboration. What they bring into this moment is something exceptional, drawing on those roots but expressing it in a way that makes it absolutely current and contemporary with what's going on today. We couldn't ask for a better moment in time to hear from these two absolutely amazing uh, musicians, performers, presenters, poets. Tonight, they'll be doing the full show that they've called Blackbird Fly. If you want, you can buy tickets. There is a special uh, student price of $20. It's tonight, it's in the Tele Studio, which is just adjacent to the big 
uh, Hall in the Chan Center. Over here, we have our uh, lovely ticket seller waiting to uh, take your money if you'd like. Uh, there is also treats put over there by the Chan Center, and we thank them for all their support of this event. But I don't want to waste any more of your time because this is something I find really exciting. They're here to explain some of their process, show us what they do, help us to get a deeper insight into this amazing work they're doing. So without further uh, nonsense from me, Mark, Bumut, Joseph, Daniel Bramar, Romain, DBR, hit it hard, let us know what you're all about. <laughs> someone's home or someone's sacred space. What's more sacred than a place of learning and education and vulnerability and science? You know, there's nothing more welcoming than a teacher who gets it. A teacher who understands that education is synergetic. That education is a conversation in the best sense. So my name is Daniel Bernard Remain. This is my very good friend, my soul brother, Mark Bamuti Joseph. And we're here to say something, and when we want you to say something, then we'll have something. And already the conversation has begun. Last night we landed from some jet plane, and we met a good man, he's right back there. And this good man, you know, talked about pride and the place and purpose, he took us on the shores of your town. I love this notion of splitting atoms. I love this. Hello! 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 Hello. 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 How are you? Good. Yeah. It's really good to see you. You too. Yeah, it's good to be seen. <laughs> Started playing the violin when I was five years old, small town called Margate, Florida, not Fort Lauderdale, not Pompano Beach, not Miami, not Vancouver. Those places are cool. And by cool, I mean real, by real, I mean relevant, by relevant, I mean a relationship to each one of you. Hello! Hello! Hi. How are you? Great. Very good to see you. May I play for you? Oh, thank you. Thank you. May I play for you? Yeah. 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 May I play for you? Yes! You know, energy is so important, as has already been exhibited. Energy is so important. Energy tells you something about enthusiasm. And enthusiasm tells you something about commitment and tempo and rhythm. Splitting atoms rather than splitting hairs. I love that. This used to be horse hair. Now it's something else. And this used to be a violin. Now it's a wood box. So I take ownership of this. I take ownership. It's not the violin. It's my violin. It's not the violin. It's my violin. And there's a difference. So I think about the space between the bridge and the fingerboard. When I was very young, I started moving the bow, breaking the rules. If they told me to do something, I did the opposite thing. Straddling traditions, the past, the present, the ever-looming future. And by moving the bow, I discovered the sound became electric, like a low-pass or a high-pass filter. Frequencies were canceled. I can make my violin breathe. Let's breathe. And through the nose, out through the mouth. Inhale, five seconds. Hold it. Exhale, five seconds. Let's build each other. So let your breath find you 500 miles down the road. I wanted my violin to breathe. And I thought about filtering. So I wrote a piece called Filter. This is about Paganini, that great Italian virtuoso. And this is about Prince, that great Italian virtuoso. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you dig Thank <laughs> you. 
taking real ownership of a tradition and making it your own. So my violin has no limits. I can have a conversation with anyone. It can be the beauty and simplicity of one note. No vibrato. Plain, patient, waiting. Waiting for words. Waiting for words. Our ancestors hacked bitterly at sugar cane. <laughs> we are the sweets never tasted by their sweet soaked bones. They begged for us to be here, never knowing who or what we become. We are their echoing elegy perpetually sung. We are their echoing elegy perpetually <laughs> Ooh, ooh, you got mountains to climb, skies to fly, 
seeds to seeds, seeds to roots to branches to leaves. The deepest part of God's imagined possibilities billowing like a willowing wind. All one, all men must. My son is 13. Three months before he was born, my grandfather died three times in one night. My grandfather flatlined and revived. He slipped into a coma twice. The last time he came back bragging about this man-child that he just met in the after death, after which his word became flesh, became sacred text. The next testament, my first breath, my first born, a boy. And man, he looked just like my granddad. <laughs> Uh, they recently met inside of a revelation while granddad was doing orbital revolutions around his own life. The last time he was confronted at a crossroads by my son, Makai, of blood and bone and sacrifice. Sanctified, my granddad said, I cannot wait for you to meet your son. And for the first time, I really understood where the old man was coming from. I believe in him. I must, there's a race to be run, our folks are losing. Past is prologue, our epicenter is an ancestor's epilogue, an epithet, if we ain't eased that ancestor's burden yet. He used his great-grandfather's death as a scroll to scribe a new scripture. He whisked a man back to life with unborn whisper. Son, do you know who you are? An ascendant, descendant, deciphered from stars. Intone the indescribable like a shadow, my son. We are men, bury nothing but bones, cry rivers of tears. Deeply we run, a race to be won, a race to be won. Guided like Harriet with visions of sugar plum skinned, hung thin, strange fruit, our roots reach deep. We men, our men, our men, I mean, your dean, your duty, your destiny to shadow the ascendant, descendant, disciple, in tone, in tone, the indescribable, like a shadow, my son. I know you must move, because of the way you move me. Woo! Your destiny to move, like the way you move me. I know you must move, because of the way you walk. away from the energy. You should. Yeah. Like, yeah, because we learn 
from this moment, from this energy, from the interaction, and that helps everything else that we do. Excellent. Excellent. Um, thank you guys for your perspective. I think I hear most immediately that uh, we are educators in the room. Is that true? For the most part, we are um, educators. We're about to be educators. Our um, um, training and um, kind of the intersection of literacy and social discourse has brought us to a place where we would like to facilitate the process of others in our charge. Give or take, more or less. <laughs> Sweet. Sweet. Um, so, uh, I was telling Daniel, I was like, these are my people. My graduate degree is in education. I taught high school, you know, I taught high school for, uh, uh, for several years. I ran a nonprofit called Youth Speaks. I worked primarily with 13 to 19 year old um, poets. And um, the mission of the organization is to um, uh, provide pathways for self-discovery through the written and spoken words. So, you are my people. <laughs> you know. um, so, again, um, so, um, so in that space and in the space of um, pedagogical accountability, I apologize in advance for um, any Thing that feels unidirectional. There is a lot of content that I think that we might um, traverse over the course of the next hour um, and some change. Um, so where um, it feels like reciprocity is not happening, I apologize. Um, I, I think we want to talk a little bit about literacy um, and maybe just get a sense from you um, what you think that means. What's literacy? For me, a way to contextualize the world around me, really. So, um, some people have <coughs> musical literacy, some people have digital literacy, uh, body, and aesthetic. So, a way to, uh, yeah, just interpret the world around me. Excellent. Yes, yeah, so it's just a $20 word for understanding. $20 word for understanding, no doubt. That's so funny. That's like the. Uh, <laughs> it's like the difference between people from the United States and people in Canada. Like you call it a twenty dollar word, we call it a million dollar word. You know, like, 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 you know, like inflation. It's just like you know, it's just, <laughs> literacy, understanding, codification. Literacy, yes. Opportunity. I'd like to stay right there. Um, the relationship between literacy and power, um, the capacity to understand, to codify, to contextualize um, your your world, to um, but but all that leveraged against institutional power and power systems. Um, I'd like very briefly to um, show you a clip from my friend uh, Dream Hamlin's film. Um, this is called um, Treasure from Tragedy to Transjustice. Um, just want to show you a, a little bit. And you might go there because it was boring. And I also hit the green button over here. <laughs> I'm picking the right button. Um, just go on here.
you have for dismemberment. It's a big question whether you have any parts, all the parts, or you know, just some of them. So we were lucky to get some more parts. her hands and her feet. I can't really remember the dates and stuff, but what I remember is her calling my mom, you know, saying she was scared about something. And so, you know, as soon as I hear that, I'm, I'm all ears. And she was saying that, you know, she was calling her hotel um, with, with some marijuana and stuff. And they say, you know, they wanted her to be some type of informant to, you know, keep her out of trouble. And, um, and she was confused, she didn't know what to do, but you're not, you don't really know this guy. So she felt, look, it's, it's him over me, so. That's what it was. And I guess they didn't get what they wanted from from Treasure. And they and I guess they thought that she didn't really like matter to anybody. So they just by the time like two days later, we get a call, she's she's missing. <clears throat> October 2011, I was chief of police uh, at the time in the city of Detroit, and uh, I remember very vividly uh, being in New York City for, um, I was on the board of Common Justice, and I received a, a phone call from my head of homicide to inform me that they found a torso, uh, and it was, uh, he was speculating that possibly uh, it could be that of a missing 19-year-old, uh, Shelly Hilliard. Uh, but we didn't have a lot to go on, but the call in and of itself was uh, alarming, uh, very gruesome. I started to get subsequent phone calls uh, about finding different body parts in different parts of the city. And uh, I think our professional experience led us to believe that there was a good possibility uh, that there was some connection between the body parts we were finding and, and Shelly uh, being missing. And uh, fortunately, after a period of time, uh, because of a tattoo uh, on the torso, uh, the family identified, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it turned out to be Shelly Hill. So the person that they're talking about, Shelly Hillier, and we can um, leave the, the lights right there for just, for just a moment. Uh, trans woman was murdered in 2011. Um, this is her story. Just gonna uh, fast forward to a little bit of testimony. Thinking like that's a nightclub. Like it gotta be a club or some place where like I don't know what I was thinking. But so when we went, it was such a home feeling. Like everybody was eating and playing and talking and very welcoming. Like I just remember feeling like, hey, it's more people that's just like me that actually like each other. And then I learned that I was not only like becoming older and learning more about what it means to be a part of the community, but I was finding a place that had really good resources for me to like be able to wash my clothes or get something to eat. Spent most of my time when I just didn't feel like being in any spaces that was not affirming, um, whether that be school or home at the time. So that's how I came to find out about the Blue Devil Center. And so many opportunities had just came from that, like places I'd never been before I was able to explore with the Ruth Ellis Center. So the ministry is a variety of how social identities might be named for one person. We're going to do a dice rolling activity. And I, I like to invite more people who feel like they really kind of got the concepts that we discussed to engage in this activity. You can write their hat. So just um, kind of randomly drop it to their hands one at a time. <laughs> First word is transgender. 
And where did you put that? Where would you categorize that term based on the categories that we have here? Biological sex, gender identity, gender expression, or orientation? We have androgynous. Androgynous. And where would you categorize that? Yeah. Good job. Okay, next. <laughs> we have transition. When I came out as a gay man, it was just kind of like, people was like, um, well, you know, are you a top or a bottom? And, you know, that's a research in itself. And then I got to this journey of different identities, and I was just like, well, you know, I'm not the most masculine, not really the most feminine. So I stuck with the androgynous perception of life for a long time. Like, yeah, like whenever I wanted to display my femininity, I was just like, oh, yeah, I'm androgynous. And it was just like, because I had not yet to learn about the transgender community. And it was just like, in my mind, I was just like, I want to be a woman so bad. Like, I know I'm supposed to be this. And like, my body is just not matching up with how I feel. And um, I was just like, I don't know, I don't know. But I guess the closest thing to that would be a gay man. So here I am. Um, and then when I was just like, you know what, Shorty, you really have to stop lying to yourself. Like. It's okay that you may face all these challenges because you do it now. So live in your authentic truth. Like there's nothing wrong with being exactly who you want to be because, and I started looking back and reflecting that in my life, I had went against every odd situation or a person that told me like that's not who I'm supposed to be. So then it was just really being okay with who I am and affirming that. And so on Wednesday when I was on my way home from the center, at the bus stop and I was just minding my own business and um, there was this guy who was um, obviously drunk. So what you're, um, what you've seen, what you've heard are testimonies from various um, members of the transgender uh, community in the city of Detroit. The subject of this film, and if we had more time, um, we would go into um, more narrative depth, but the subject of the film is Shelley Hilliard who um, at 19, um, trans woman, sex worker, um, was caught with a, a fair amount of marijuana in her hotel room. The police busted in. Um, they knew that she was just kind of a distribution outpost. So um, they said, who's your dealer? You know, who's your distributor? Um, they said, if you don't, um, if you don't tell us, we're going to take you to jail. As um, a person um, born male, um, transitioning um, to a female body, you can imagine what that might be like. I mean, ain't nobody want to go to jail, period. But you definitely want to go. Don't want to go in under those circumstances in the city of Detroit. Um, so she basically, you know, ratted out her distributor. Um, and then the police, in a break of protocol, informed um, kind of the crew of who the informant was. So they snitched on their snitch. And two days later, uh, Shelley was murdered. Now, um, I bring all this up because there are words that are used in this narrative, and there are situations that are used in the narrative that complicate our general and broad understanding of literacy. Because yeah, literacy is um, understanding. It's the ability to deconstruct our worlds. But literacy is also about power. Who has it and who doesn't? Um, and one of the things that I'd like to offer is that um, this person um, falls further away from narrative center than most of us. When I say narrative center, or maybe even ontological center or centers of power. Part of what I mean is um, at the center of our Western narrative is gender. We exist in a patriarchy. Yes, no? Yes. Okay. And maybe right outside of that center is race or ethnicity. 
Now, some, I, you know, depending on, you know, what day it is, I don't know if race is in the middle or if gender is in the middle, but one of those two. What would you say is right after that? Well, class, class, yeah. Um, somebody said religion. Ethnicity. Say again. Ethnicity. Ethnicity, yes. Sexuality. Sexuality, yes. Education. Education, yeah. So let's say those are like the five or six kind of central rungs, right? Um, race, class, gender, religion, sexuality, education. So if you are um, gender fluid, broke, black, not ascribing to kind of Judeo-Christian mores, and undereducated, um, you are pretty far away from our central narrative, from our central ontological narrative. And that impacts your safety in terms of being able to express your narrative, to express your own agency. So part of the reason why I show you this clip and I, and I bring up um, Treasure's story is because um, as far away as she was, from central narrative, um, that became a contributing force to how disposable she was at the end of her life. For the cops to say, oh, no one cares about this person, this broke, black, underclassed, undereducated, <clears throat> gender fluid, no one cares. And so we can rat her out. Yes? The people, you know, Sue the cops, or did anything happen? Yeah, so now, so what I would recommend is that you just, you know, <laughs> Dream Film is on the film circuit. It's called Treasure. I would recommend that you, um, but you can also um, look up the the facts of the case. There's a there's a civil uh, there's a civil case about. Um, the the for for educators for what we want to do, what we want to accomplish um, in our classrooms and in our lives is essentially create and construct safe space for everyone to achieve um, agency through their literacies, through their multiple literacies. As artists, what Daniel and I strive to do is to create a landscape for trans justice. By trans justice, I, I mean not kind of this intersectional Venn diagram where everything comes together and we're all kumbaya in the middle, but really where like um, everyone has capacity to express their most honest selves. Um, and we create cultural landscape, um, hopefully heighten the public imagination in such a way where the multiple expressions of our humanity are welcomed, affirmed, um, and not necessarily um, consolidated, but um, um, but living and breathing harmoniously. Um, I want to share one more um, take on this idea of literacy with you. I want you to look around and I want you to think about intentional community design. Like, how is it that we all happen to be here together at this one moment in time? Who are the advocates? Who are the voices? What are the faces? of what is possible. Petition the city government of Oakland to dream with us. We, the people, ask our government very simply to invest in life with us. I was the living gold they stole, but my skin remembers the people to whom I was connected. Teach like Malcolm, fight like Ali, but the feel like a cow with the light in me, my hand. 
to the notion that the future is some sort of murky yes. place. It's, it's defined by us. Yes. 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 One and then two. Yeah. I think uh, it's, it's, it's tough to shut out this, this need that we have to make money, to go to work every day, to serve some other big corporation or master. There's big corporations in Oakland too. But, yes. like, if, but and, and that's the irony. Like, if you just don't obey this voice to make money, you know, make more money, then, then you can have what you just showed us. I totally agree. I think that the public will is the only force greater than private funds, mm -hmm. right. private resource, right? And so what we're talking about is public will. Okay. Um, that this is my, yeah, this is my life. I feel like you had to pick a side, you know, like <coughs> once you're University, University of Louisiana first and predominantly white, you get to pick a side. So I didn't really have any Caucasian friends for six years for me. Yes. This was, uh, this was set in Oakland, right? Yes. And uh, I think I've got like, a lot of respect for Oakland. Like, one, after seeing this, and two, um, by total coincidence, I happened to be in Oakland a few weeks ago. Um, and of course, there's like a huge stereotype uh, of Oakland in the Bay Area uh, of being like crime and, and just a terrible place. Um, anyway, I went into Oakland, and they've got these great posters out right now, um, really big, and they have pictures of um, regular citizens. And they sort of tell their story, and it's like, oh, Jim is a blah, 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 he does this and that, uh, he's involved in this and this. And then there's like, hashtag is uh, wreck the city. Yeah. 
and this, uh, these posters are all across the city of just different regular people, and I kind of speak to what you say about um, the public trying to, the public world and trying to change that perception. Thank you. One minute. Yes. Good know your uh, movie, your chart just struck me. It's sad to see, like, 2,500 years ago, I mean, human rights was declared. And it's sad to see today we are struggling. The first declaration came from Cyrus the Great. And there is a poet, Sadi. There's two lines I would like to read it. I hope the translation makes sense. It says, human beings are members of whole of the whole in creation of one essence and soul. If one member is appreciated with pain, other members uneasy will remain. If you have no sympathy for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. This is a poem from 900 years ago, a Persian Iranian poet called Sadi, which translated that 2,500 years message from Cyrus to play. Still a long way to go. Right? <laughs> it's a long way to go, but it, but it speaks to uh, what the brother echoed about uh, about how we strategize for the future. Um, one and two. Um, I I found there was an awful lot of accepting the label of other um, when that's destructive in itself. You can find power in it's distorting as well, and it's important to, to avoid that, I think. Sorry, um, Accepting the label as if black, or being um, Asian, or being white, or being normal or abnormal, it, it should be avoided, I think. It, you can find significant power in, in the being, but it, it's also a dangerous thing to do, distorting. If only the bullets weren't raining down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. yeah. I saw a celebration of gifts and literacy that aren't always celebrated in our education system. Kids were skateboarding, kids were freestyling. These kids have extraordinary gifts, and they often become alienated because their gifts aren't valued in the traditional education system. Yes. Um, <laughs> thank you for. Um, for the, the wide spectrum of, um, of commentary. Um, um, this is an environmental festival. And um, we talk about um, ecological literacies. And um, we move from um, a place where uh, the festival used to be called Red, Black, and Green. And we use the word green as kind of the indicator of the primary value. Um, green like um, uh, like a federal dollars to oil subsidies. Green like the BP logo. <laughs> green like shoots in a decimated economy, never to bear fruit. Green. So, um, so we move the word green out of the title um, of, of the festival, and, and we switch instead to life is living to assert. Um, life as um, not an indicator of where the communities that we were working with should go, but um, as an affirmation of some place where we already were. Um, and the, the kind of bottom line philosophy, the foundation of this work, is um, that um, as much as you know, photovoltaic um, energy and um, hybrid vehicles and conservation, and as as much as um, these practices are necessary for um, the inevitable sustainability, or what I hope is the sustainability of um, human life on this planet, um, none of that is really going to mean so much if we maintain a kind of um, social hierarchy that others and that um, creates space or um, kind of um, creates psychic space to accept other, right? That, the, that our social ecologies um, precede the stewardship of our physical ecologies um, in this space. And so one of the first things that we have to do 
in order to um, help move our communities towards um, an environmental ethic was to move out of um, the social pathologies of the nutritional industrial complex or the educational nutritional complex. Um, what, you know, what the brother was saying um, about just kind of um, stereotypes around the city of Oakland, um, quite literally, um, you know, when there was a, when there's a murder that happens every day, right, and this was true maybe six, seven years ago, the, the crime is a lot better now, but um, if there's a murder every day in your city, you actually have to question the value of human life in your community, like what that is, particularly when many of those murders go unsolved, right? So, um, so I, I, I bring this into the room today to talk about um, language and literacy and the, the power to affect change, not only through um, nomenclature, but through visual and experiential literacies. And I think all this is important to bring up for educators and um, educators in training, because um, the, the lessons themselves, the epistemology itself, the, the content units um, themselves are not enough, would be my suggestion. That there um, is kind of the basic practicum. There's the, you know, there's the execution. There's the, you know, folks gotta learn to read. Folks gotta learn to write. Folks gotta learn, you know, three plus eight is twelve. <laughs> um, but as many of you noted, um, we also have to do the work of bridging those kind of epistemological units to a broader sense of survival and ideally to a sense of um, transcendence of the <coughs> present moment. Um, it is our responsibility as educators, my wife is a kindergarten teacher, she's awesome. I don't know how she does it. I don't know how she does it. You know, she's been at this for 16, 17 years. Um, she works mostly with five and six year olds. I said to her one day, do you ever meet a dumb kid? Tell me the truth. <laughs> you, know what I mean? you know, this is how we met almost 20 years ago. We, we, you know, we're, we're, we were both um, teachers at the time. Um, you know, so I say, you know, 20 years later, man, you ever meet a dumb kid? She says no. You know, but something happens between my kindergarten and first grade. You know, kindergarten, a kid comes in. I, you know, I met a, I, I went to uh, the first day of school at my wife's school. And um, um, I, met a, I met a small boy who, for an hour, was a Tyrannosaurus. No, he was a, he was a Velociraptor. And so I said, hey, you know, and he said, rah! I said, rah! You know, we just kept rah, rah, you know, back and forth. Like, that was our whole thing. You know, but then playtime ended, and then he was just back to being Jimmy. You know, kids come in in kindergarten, they, you know, um, have cat noses, or they have um, capes on, or they have, you know, they're, right? And then in first grade, it's like, dog, really? Like a cape? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a, a raptor, like for real? Like that's just for real? You know? So we beat that out of our kid. We beat the drum out of our kids pretty quickly, you know? So like the, the, the journey for an educator is to find, is to strike that balance. And so um, I showed you treasure and showed you a little bit of um, life is living to indicate that, um, that the place where Daniel and I um, exist in terms of the coming together of our various media, the, our responsibility, our accountability um, as artists um, is to find um, and to create these safe spaces for multiple literacies. And to demonstrate, even um, in kind of the movement, the text, the music, I mean, you saw how many different um, traditions Daniel was able to explore on one instrument. As a matter of fact, he's literally innovated the instrument. There's, there's no other instrument like that one in the world, and maybe he can tell you a little bit more about it. But, but those are the things that educators, I think, have to do. Right? Um, we come to traditional literacies with a sense of evolution so that 
um, we provide safe space for our students to go comfortably and confidently into their own futures. Mm, I'm sorry, dude. I, I don't, I'm, I, no, don't leave. I gotta, do not leave. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta say real quick, I have never spent more time with this man in the last 10 days or so. So I've seen every time it's something unique. Every time there's just truth in a deep way. And I just wanna I wanna enter into the conversation because it'll keep going and then you can't enter the conversation and then you know. But um wow, I'm just like, okay, so what I'm thinking about right now is I want to continue our conversation. Let's do it then. Because I think that as educators you are ascribed and charged with this notion of conversation and confrontation. That your students come in loaded. Something mm. does happen. I started playing the violin when I was five years old because fifth graders were playing the violin. Melissa Cole, I had a crush on her. <laughs> she played the violin. She was, still is, gorgeous. <laughs> and the violin was a place of communion. Mm. Then in sixth grade, I said, I want to be a violinist, and a teacher told me, well, I don't know if black people play the violin. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, well, of course. Well, she was wrong. She was expressing her own experience, right? At that time, remember, this is 1979, okay? She wasn't irresponsible. She's human. And in a way, it was a good challenge. In a way, it was a smack in the face. Because up until that time, violin playing wasn't about race at all. It was about community. Suddenly, wow, black people, and I remember thinking, I don't even, yeah. I thought, I don't know any black violinists, you know? Even though my mother's father played the violin, a lawyer from Haiti. I wonder where that instrument is. Let's think about that. But something happens. Something does happen. And as much as we want to think and truly hang on to the notion that education in the classroom is sacred, Mark Graham talks about the sacred space, right? It's also a place where I think dreams are deferred, dreams die. Mm -hmm. I bet you, you can think of the teacher that saved your life, I think you can think of the teacher that almost took your life, right? I am so, I can think of my, the bet, Miss Hieronymus, God bless her, gifted teacher, elementary school, made us write essays every single day. Sometimes copying the works of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln made us copy Joni Mitchell lyrics. <laughs> Both sides now. Actually, yeah. can you imagine? Radical, right? Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. um, but I can think of Charles Noble, too. Nine years old, and I got a big black afro, and it's Sunday, 2 to 4 p.m. after church, and Mr. Miller, my first violin teacher, who incidentally, Mr. Miller, if you were the best violinist in school, you played Hatikva. I sick for each year. And the thing that was so wonderful and magical about that is that, you know, a little Haitian boy, I didn't know where Israel was. I had no idea what the Hatikva meant. And in South Florida, playing Hatikva to survivors meant something. But I remember being in, in a fourth grade, big black afro, crisp white shirt, it's after church. And my father drove me for the first time, I'm going to play with the Broward County Community College Youth Symphony. So there's people in there who were uh, 18 years old. Through 70 years old, you know? Big orchestra. 
I had never seen an orchestra before. And somebody let me in, and I'm nine years old. And I'm sitting in the back. You have to understand, second violin, last chair, really means for everybody in the orchestra, you're the worst musician there. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say it, but that's what it means. So I'm sitting there, but man, I'm so happy. Academic festival overture, I listened to it. I, lo I looked at the score. I think I had a picture of Brahms you know, there. I practiced for weeks. I'm like the youngest kid in there. Nobody's talking to me. You know, I felt like kind of an intruder, but I don't care. I'm there. Charles Noble comes up, big, hammer, big baton, and here you go. I can tell. Oh my God, drinking songs. That's what this piece is built on, right? To do the research. Well, just know the story. So it's folk music in the best sense, and it's to me, it's. Oh, Second violins have the best part. Of course we do. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm playing, man. I'm like, oh my god, two hours of this? Two hours was enough. And I'm nine years old, so it felt like eight hours. And it wasn't enough. And my father picked me up and went back home. I told him all about it. You know what I mean? If you have a son or a daughter or a cousin, whatever it is, that excitement, it's 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 it's, it's all encompassing. Brahms was all over me. I went to bed dreaming about Brahms. I dreamed about him all week long till went to church, got through it. Next time, my dad said, you know what, you know where it is, go by yourself. Oh my God, I'm walking on this campus by myself. <laughs> my dad, I mean, I felt like bulletproof. I got back there, rousing out my bow. I don't care, I took me to the <coughs> master. And I'm sitting there, Charles Noble, nobody's talking to me. Charles Noble comes in, okay, here we go. And good morning. <laughs> You there. What's your name? Danny. Stand up. <clears throat> you made a mistake. Apologize to us. I said, I'm sorry. Louder. We can't hear you. You made a mistake. We're doing important work here. Apologize to us. I started to cry. I said, I'm sorry. Louder. Louder so we can all hear you. I, I'm sorry. Don't do it again. Sit down from the beginning. Now, something happens. I mean, 18, 20, 30, 40, 50, 70 year old people, nobody is going to say nobody wants to be losing. Look at that little kid, my stand partner. My mistake. I remember thinking then and now, that was an important moment for both of us. I'm still talking about it. I can't get over it. I can't get over it. It's a, I, talking about it, it's as real. I'm, I'm looking at you right now and all those feelings come back. You talk about a wound. Because I wanted somebody to save me. So I wanted him to save me. You know, I wanted somebody to say, it's okay. It's okay. If my stand partner is okay, Nobody. I never felt more black. I never felt more outside. I never felt, I never got back in the car and my father looked at me and I'm like, oh, I'm okay. Because you know, that's what kids do, right? We hold it inside. I mean, that was a moment where I could have stopped playing the violin and who would blame me? Could you blame me? Man. Now, to Charles Noble, huh, it was a lesson for everybody else but me. But it was a lesson. Because I, now, you know what I say? <clears throat> oh, it's okay. That's not your mistake. That's our mistake. That's how the audience hears it. It's okay. That's cool. That's a blue note, man. The blue note. Everybody play that note. Everybody make that sound. <laughs> I love that. You know what? Charles, John Cage, you know John Cage? He thinks all sounds are valid. So that's a good sound. Give a hand to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not your mistake. That's not your, that's our mistake. That's how the audience is going to hear it. Let's not make the same mistake twice. <laughs> but that's okay. So that was a great lesson. That was a great gift that Charles Noble gave. You know what happens? A lot of young people can never turn it around. And I think it's subtle. I think sometimes our insensitivity, our lack of diversity, a bullet is easy. I get it. You talked about having to defend your African American brother. It's a lot harder to do in words. You know, to look at an officer in the eye and get into their head, <coughs> am I free to go? Am I free to go? You know? 
There's something powerful about understanding language. And I would say, you know, it's not just literacy, it's non-literacy and illiteracy as well. That was a moment where Charles Noble, that great conductor, was completely illiterate to the needs of that young nine-year-old African-American boy with an afro playing a violin. Because had he known, had he known, I would like to think he wouldn't have said that. And everybody in this room has a story like that. So my ex-wife, I love her, we're cool, we have a son together. She's a special education teacher. And one day she asked me, well, you know, Daniel, I gotta go into my class. I gotta do, I don't know what to do. It's the first day. Da, 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 okay, you know, how can I get their attention? I said, okay, look, you know what? Top of my head. I don't actually it was a pencil. But let's just say it doesn't matter. It does matter, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so I'm just making a bottle. I said, make it a bottle of water. Have everybody come in and have that and, and, and say, hey everybody, this is Joe. Meet Joe. And have every one of your students assign a quality to Joe. Who do they want Joe to be? Right? Every day have them come in and greet Joe and let's make I was actually a pencil. But let's make that inanimate object. Let's give it profound meaning. Do it for a week with your students. Just say, and let them, and, and, say, and tell me what happens. We were divorced at the time. She said, man, on Monday it was kind of, but by Friday, Joe had clothes. <laughs> Joe had a family. They brought in little mini bottles of water. <laughs> you know, they built a house for Joe. They, I mean, Joe was this precious thing. I have to ask you what happened. That was the first week. The point was, we can talk about empathy all day long. We can talk about, but how do we do it imaginatively? You know, are you going to be the teacher that comes into this paradigm? I'm here, you're there. Right? Listen to. Right? Or can you make it, can, where do the performing arts have a place in your living arts? How immediate and potent and vital can your imagination be? Let's all go back to seven years old right now. My, oh, sorry, let's do it. Ready? My. Uh, imagination. imagination. I know, I know. <laughs> Indulge me, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> my my imagination. imagination. Now, where is your imagination? Put it on a different place on your body this time. Ready? My. Uh, no, 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 don't copy me. Put it on a place. Okay, sorry, that's misleading. Take your hand. It can be here. It can be here. Put, the, put it where it is. I want to see it. On three. One, two, three. My. my. Oh, interesting. Imagination. Imagination. That's interesting. Believe me, my six-year-old son, if I ever did, he would do this. My imagination. You know, he's all about it. He's emojis. Oh, but, 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 but. But isn't that wonderful? So the, I think. So I think part of this is making it immediate, making it fluid making it accessible, but making it your own. It's not the violin, it's my violin. There's a difference, it's not just the classroom. It's just not the tradition of teaching. But how are you, how immediate can you, how immediate can you be in the potent nature of your imagination? So, I hope this is excruciatingly relevant to <coughs> what you're charged with, because I actually do think whether you want to accept that or not, you are changing lives or saving lives. You absolutely are. This is my weapon of choice. Were it not for the violin, were it not for Mr. Miller, I dare say I'd be lost. Statistically speaking, I would be something very different as an af so called African American. I don't identify that, I identify as Haitian American, right? There's a big difference. But that violin saved my life and shaped my life. It made all the difference. If you go to Margate Elementary <coughs> School right now, there is no more string program. In fact, in Broward County, most elementary schools, all you can't play the you can't play an orchestral instrument at all. And by and you know by middle school, it's too late. But high school, forget it. You are also competing with this. I talked about a pencil, a bottle of water. You know, most kids don't write. So what is the traditions that you're already fighting against or in conversation with? I talk about straddling the tradition of violin playing with my own. It's not, it's, not, it's not an omission, it's not a rejection of violin playing. It's actually an embrace. So, how can we give voice to that, really quickly, because we do want to hear from you. 
or Mark, I need you to. Actually, no. Uh, better. Give a hand right here. Yeah, stand up. Yes. Uh, get on this side for some reason. I don't know why. I'm kind of a right. So my father, man, 290. Muscle. I mean, a little bit of a belly, but muscle. 20 inch calves. But he was a Haitian man. French, Spanish, Europe. Time life records, Von Carrion, Beethoven symphonies, right? But his son's growing up in Margate, Florida, right? And in Margate, Florida in the 70s and in the 80s, when two black, you're a black man right now. When two black men meet each other, it's like, hey, what's up? Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah. Give a hand to that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, Dad, you're doing it wrong. You're making it all soft. This is hard. And he said, next time, okay, next time. This is an ongoing joke for years. I'd say, Dad, how you doing? Yeah, and I go in there. Get in here. Oh, it's so nice to see you. <laughs> you know, especially when I came back from college. You know, <coughs> the affection was going that way. So any opportunity he had to embrace his son. And like I could see it in his eyes. I said, Dad, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> On April 20th, 2013, from 4 to 8, Mark and I were in a duet. Don't leave. Don't leave. Don't leave. Mark and I were in a duet in this piece for the marching band. Mark and I, you know you can hear the sound.
There is. Yeah, come on up. And I love that. You know, that's empowering for us too. Anybody. I always say, I'm never going to ask you to do something I won't do myself. I will never ask you to do something I won't do myself. I think that is one of the most fundamental aspects of education. Vulnerability. Allow us. Because I, I can tell you, when I was five years old, I remember, man, my dad had asked me to do something you'd never do yourself. <laughs> you know? But anyway, let's see your variation on it. The whole thing? Oh, we should have your name. Oh, you, you, are, you are. Hi, I'm John. John? <laughs> Kyle. Kyle. Michael. Michael. All right. Do the whole thing. Yeah. So do the whole thing. We'll do it together. So, okay. like, Haiti has a very unique spirit. And I don't just mean your own connections and its history with Ubuntu as, as a tradition, out of a tradition, mixing so many others. But it's gone through what appears to be some of the worst possible human disasters and catastrophes. It's had environmental catastrophes and political catastrophes. And just, there's so much desperation and sadness that, you know, not, not even having been there, just hearing about it. it how, how do you work with that? Because you go both got this connection. And it's, a, it's a special connection. I, I think you made mention of that because you see yourself as a Haitian American. And 
is both this place of enormous power, but it's also some history of earthquakes. Just so, how do you deal with that? <coughs> um, Haiti, for those of you who don't know, Haiti or Haiti is the poorest country in the hemisphere. It's also um, the first country post um, Columbus to um, harbor a successful uh, slave revolt from the Haitian people. Napoleon's army um, in 1804. Um, very shortly after um, defeating Napoleon's army, the French enacted a tax on the Haitian people for beating them. You know, so you can you can imagine like, you know, um, but let's say after World War II, all the Allied powers would. You know, after the Allied powers defeated the Axis powers, and Italy and Germany turned around and be like, "All right, cool. Now you owe us money." <laughs> um, and then on top of that, um, um, they um, the, the chief export in Haiti at the time and um, still is was sugar, and the world economies um, <coughs> isolated um, Haiti out of the sugar trade. So um, there was a systemic economic depression um, of the country, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, military occupations, et cetera. Um, now, that's, a, that's just a matter of record. You know, that's a matter of record. Um, I, I think what, where Daniel and I live in that question is, one, that's not the entirety of um, people. It's not the entirety of the emotional landscape. It's um, the, the music, the spirituality, the um, the, the various industry that has emerged out of that kind of nadir is really amazing. Um, I think, too, um, perseverance is the hallmark of African descended people in America, African descended people in this, um, in this hemisphere. Uh, you know, we point out um, Haiti, but you could say, you know, I'd say that about any immigrant or any group of immigrants that are systemically um, marginalized. Um, so the way that we deal is to be harbingers for perseverance and joy. So um, you know, there's, a, there's a piece in our, in our concert that's an ode to black joy. And um, you know, one of the things that we say is um, you know, we, we, we talk about joy in the living black body and how that matters, right? Um, so much of the conversation, so much of the meme around Black Lives Matter has been framed by rage and grief. So someone dies, Black Lives Matters, right? Um, but how do we flip that? You know, how do, how do we flip that? And so the, the singular narrative isn't, um, you know, just looking at Haiti from a place of economic or ecological depression, but really to um, authenticate and um, kind of um, foreground the, the value and joy of Haitian um, life as is evident in our communities. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the quick answer to the, there is that um, this won't make sense. That it, well, we were talking about value, PVC, I'm sure you're aware of. Just, if you're not, just Google search Kickstarter and PVC. Mm -hmm. I, I think that sometimes we co-opt certain, um, as a Haitian, as a black person, it would be really easy for me to co-opt the notion of I just don't like specifically white police officers. I think as a Haitian person, it would be easy for me to co-opt the notion of misery and poverty side by side <coughs> with extreme wealth. We're at the Fairmont, and I kept, you go in the Fairmont, man. Right, okay, you got it, right? Gucci. And I kept thinking, if this restaurant behind me was a soup kitchen, wow, that would actually transcend that place. I, I, think, this is, I think it's a time for it. And I think we can easily call out the notion, or minimize, minimize the notion of what each of you will do, are already doing, as educators, as, lead, as leaders, as social entrepreneurs. So all of this to say that, man, I've got to, like, what are the individual, personal, quote unquote, minimal ways that I can inform, respond to, digest, and express aesthetics of misery and poverty in a way that necessarily isn't Kim Kardashian-like, 
But it has to do with the person next to me and that person next to me. So to answer your question, we have misery in Vancouver. You know, Thomas Jefferson saw Toussaint Louverture as a threat to America. A threat to America. There was an <laughs> Ernest Roumain who met Abraham Lincoln. As you can Google search that too, absolutely. So I can look at Haiti's situation and yet it is dire. I don't think it's ever going to change. They're stuck on a notion of revolution and poverty and caste. <clears throat> revolution, poverty, caste, lack of education. It's like a broken needle. But what I can do, and I think this is what the performing arts is uniquely qualified to do, a place like the Chance Center, where the <coughs> mundane becomes magical, a bottle of water becomes Joe, <laughs> a handshake become something that I can express to you in a powerful way that's not about my father, it's about your family. And a, and a thing like Kickstarter can say, you know what, we've made a lot of money, now we are going to start giving a lot of money back just because we can follow our lead. So I think that I have to not get consumed with the number of comments on my Facebook page and you know the share I have to get consumed really with quality over quantity. You know, I share this moment with this person. If we put this on a stage with Mark talking it through with the right lights at the right time, you know, it really does become magical. I'm thinking that Blackbird Fly needs an opening act. <laughs> needs an opening act. Yeah. Oh way too long. That was one answer. I'm so sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to say that really, I, as an educator, I really appreciate what you're doing here today because as educators, I think we play around with the voices. Um, you know, we make the platform to to hear all the different voices that our students make, that the people around us make. And I think the form of expression um, is what we sometimes have to understand and, and comprehend and to bring it out. Um, so I think what you're doing, sometimes we get stuck, I think, as educators in, in constraints, you know, the education constraints, the funding constraints, et cetera. And we get stuck as well with losing our own curiosity, yeah. with not finding the inspiration. And I think you've just really renewed that. You've given us a spark. And I hope from here that we could have like a ripple effect, you know, like just from this room and then going out into the world to play around with the voices like the way you've done today. So thank you. Kids that are most resistant are the kids that you think about the most. Mm -hmm. and, and added to that, I just I know we're running out of time. I, I just want to see if I can find it. It is the generation identification. Yes. No, they they so something. The saying and you don't. Uh, is <coughs> the just group. Um, but I have to stop you. What is? Hallelujah. Yeah, if we, if we talk too much about it, we're going to... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't... Have... 
acting poetry, and then the dates that it's used to um, sanction what is choreography. Ah, uh, okay, check this out. Sir, which is, I, I think, dancing is a movement. Dude, check this out. him uh, the freedom and the license to dance even if it's back though I can't dance oh, yeah, and check this out. <laughs> <laughs> extraordinary brief moment before we out. came out that um, one of the brothers who was photographing us said to you Bill I can't dance <laughs> and you said you won't dance yeah. and he oh. insisted can't and you insisted won't and part of what you were doing there was giving him uh, the freedom and the license to dance even if it's badly, you yeah. two are a dancer. You're not going to be me, yeah. but but you can dance. Mm -hmm. and, that, um, and so 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 dig on that. And what is dance then? Mm. Well, here's my uh, kind of obnoxious uh, answer, which is I, I think dancing is a movement of people and things in space and time. And it goes on and on. You got. I just wanted to because we were talking about literacy. I think that Mark. You got to hear what Mark says. It's amazing. You can Google search it. It's easy. But I think this most. I think this hits the point. Um, there's a large man taking Bill and Mark's photograph. He's awestruck, you know, Kennedy Center. I mean, they're both award-winning people. And he says, well, I can't dance. And Bill says, no, 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 you won't dance. And I think that's so powerful. I think that is such a powerful thing, not just for this, but for us, you know, that whatever you find in your life, in your classroom, in your teaching, that is not or mundane or static, how can you make it vital, vibrant, alive, yours, that kind of ownership? And I do think the Chan Center, I do think the things that happen on that stage every night, I dare say the performing arts that happen every night, it's the one place where you can go and see vulnerability and learn vitality in a performance. And if you're not doing it already, I think that's what the performing arts really gives us, this, this example of life as so we know that we're over time. <laughs> but we are here tonight performing. We'd love to see you guys come out. We also are taking recommendations on places to eat. <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think there are like 13 different restaurants that we want to try. And then I think we just like go to a different spot to eat every hour. <laughs> yeah, because, we, because we both eat in the morning. But it's been um, really extraordinary just having this moment with you. Thank you for welcoming us. Welcome to stay as long as they have the time and you can come and talk personally if you've got more questions, which I'm sure you will. Thank you all for coming to us.